So welcome to the last video of the year and also the last notes that we're going to be doing in stats class. The topic I have for this one is what's called what else is there? You guys know that we have covered a lot of stuff in statistics. We've actually done at least something from every single chapter of your book. But you may have also noticed that there are a few things we've skipped over as we've gone through it. And some of you may also know, especially if you're going into a field like business, that you may have to take another statistics course later on in college. And you might wonder what sort of things might be covered there that we haven't done in this class. Well, what we're going to do here is we're going to real quickly go through some different things that are in statistics that we haven't really worked with this year. Now I know the first thing that's going to go through everybody's mind when they see this is, do I actually have to know anything with this or is it just sort of a time filler? The answer is, yes, you do need to know some stuff, but honestly, not a whole lot. What's going to happen when you get to your quiz this week is you're going to see a question that's not multiple choice. It's like a little brief essay question where I'm going to have a list of the topics I'm going to go through today. And I'm going to ask you to pick probably two of them and just write out real quickly, what does it mean? Just because I want you to be aware of some of these other topics, but no, you certainly don't need to know them inside or out. The first thing we're going to look at is what's called a standard deviation chi-square test. This is actually one of the topics that is in your book, but we skipped over when we were doing the chapter on chi-square. I very briefly mentioned it at the end of last week's video, but didn't really say anything about it. A standard deviation chi-square test, what you're basically looking at is, is the standard deviation bigger than it should be? Is it too big? What that would mean is that for one reason or another, your data is too spread out. The place where that mostly matters is in the field of quality control. In industry, any product that you make, there's going to be a very slight variation between each one that comes off the line and the next one. You're never going to find two things that are exactly the same at the microscopic level. Usually, a small bit of variation doesn't really matter at all. But if it starts being a lot of variation, that can be a problem. And that idea of being too varied is exactly what I mean when the standard deviation is too big. Things are too spread out. Now, in the real world, what people usually do is they'll have a little chart like these ones that you're seeing where they track things periodically. And if it goes outside like the red boundary lines on the one on the left, that's their clue that something's gone wrong and we got to make an adjustment. Sometimes you'll see multiple sets of lines. Usually the ones that are close to the middle are okay. If you go a little bit out, you need to watch things more closely. And if it goes clear to the end, then we've got a serious problem. So again, a standard deviation chi-square test, if you want to choose that one and tell me what it is, the key thing is you're asking, is the standard deviation too big? Is it too spread out? The second of these topics is something that's actually been in the news a lot just lately. And it's what's called high power tests. The thing about a high power test is that it's a test that is unlikely to overlook a significant result. If you've got something that didn't happen by chance, it's going to tell you this is significant. Now, the reason this has been in the news lately is that people have been looking for a medical test that's quick and easy that will identify whether people have the coronavirus. There have been tests for coronavirus for quite a while, but the problem is they're relying on DNA and it takes days to do that. They recently released a blood test that does give quick results, but the issue they found with it is that it has what we call false negatives. About 15% of the time, people that actually do have the disease, this test will come back saying they don't. And if you think about it, that's kind of a problem. If you actually did have COVID-19, 
but you didn't know it, you could go around and infect the whole community, and that is not a good thing. So they've been working on trying to develop a high power test that's also quick and easy to administer. And hopefully before too long we'll have something, but unfortunately it's not there yet. A high power test doesn't have false negatives, or extremely rarely will it have false negatives. The problem with a high power test is that it does produce what we call false positives. This would be like a test that tells you that you do have coronavirus, but you're really fine. And that can also be a problem, but it actually is usually a little bit less of a problem. With most medical tests, what doctors try to do is start with a high power test, and then if that comes back positive, what they'll do is give a different test to confirm it. If both of those tests are positive, then they go ahead and start treatment. Key thing about a high power test though is it's not gonna ever overlook a significant result. The third one is another thing that we skipped over in the book. This is actually in the chapter that has chi-square in it. It's what's called analysis of variance, or sometimes it's just called ANOVA. It can also be called an F test. The thing about it is you compare the mean and standard deviation of more than two samples. You know, we've looked at things like men versus women, or blacks versus whites, or one group versus another group. It's not too hard to do like a t-test to compare two groups. But what if I didn't just want to look at blacks and whites, I wanted to look at blacks, whites, Asians, Hispanics, Native Americans, all the different possible groups that I could look at. Well, with what we've done so far, the only way that we could do that is to run a whole bunch of different t-tests. You'd have to look at every possible pair, compare them, and then look at that whole mess of different t-tests. And if you have very many samples, that can rapidly get to be a lot of tests. What analysis of variance basically does is it's like it's running all of those tests at the same time, but just in one test. The trade-off with that, and it really is the reason why we skipped the topic in the book, is that it becomes a lot more complicated than just doing a z-test or a t-test. You have to work with lots of different lists and interpret a lot of different things when you do it. But again, it's just a test that compares more than two samples at the same time. Next up, we're going to look at what's called Spearman's R. This is actually another non-parametric test. Spearman's R is used to compare ranked data. Ranks like first, second, third. That's what you're looking at for ranked data. And we want to know are two different sets of rankings similar or different to each other. For example, if you ever watch like a beauty contest or of course officially they call them scholarship competitions on TV, they will sometimes show you the ratings that different judges gave to the different candidates. And a very logical question might be, okay, so did the supermodel rate people differently than the football player did? And the answer is probably yes, they're probably looking at different things for their ratings. That's comparing two different sets of rankings, though. Who was their first ranking? Who was second? Who was third? Another possibility, you know that there are many different polls that will show you who the top teams in different sports are. And you might be interested to know, for instance, was a coach's poll and a sportscaster's poll different? A lot of times it'll be the same teams, but they have the order mixed up a little bit. And a logical question will be, well, are they significantly different or just a little bit different? Key thing about Spearman's R, you can think of that R standing for ranking. It is always like first, second, third for Spearman's R. The next one I actually mentioned earlier, but we didn't really do it. It's what's called nonlinear regression. And the idea of nonlinear regression is you're looking at patterns that aren't lines. You remember those scatter plots you did in the regression chapter. What we cared about there is how close to being in a straight line were they. 
There are, however, lots of patterns that aren't lines. I actually mentioned a few weeks ago the idea of a sine regression where things go up and down like the temperature goes up during the day and down at night. That's a definite pattern, but it's not a straight line. Another kind of example that comes up is what we call a quadratic regression. It makes what we call a parabola or a U-shape. And another one that's really quite common is what we call an exponential regression. In an exponential regression, you have things that start small and very rapidly get very big. It would be like if you had a pair of rabbits and they started going at it like rabbits and suddenly you got lots and lots of rabbits. That would be exponential growth. It's also the kind of growth that we've seen with things like COVID-19. There's two other things on this list, and the next one is the one I personally know the most about. It's what's called multiple regression analysis, and the reason why I know the most about it is when I was in grad school, this is basically what my main graduate project was about. So you guys have learned about linear regression, where you plug in a number for x and you try and predict what y is going to be. For instance, there was a question on your quiz last week where it gave you a formula that Michigan State used to take people's ACT scores and try and predict their grade point average. Well, that's nice, but you guys know there's a whole lot of things that might affect grade point besides your ACT score. And in fact, almost every real life problem, there's more than just one cause and one effect. There's lots of things that go into it. What multiple regression does, and it's the thing you'd want to write down, like if you choose this one for the test, is multiple regression uses many predictors to estimate an outcome. So back when I was in graduate school, one of my professors, a good old boy named Dr. Davidson, he did research on what did predict success in college. And he knew also that like ACT might sort of, but not really very well, and there might be some other things that would predict it better. Dr. Davidson actually came up with 37 different factors that he thought might have some effect on college grade point. I'm not gonna list off all 37, but I am gonna mention a few of them. Some have included things like family income. Rich kids tended to do better than poor kids how old a student was entering college. Typically, adult students do better than people of traditional college age. Things like ITEDs, the state competency scores, had the absolute lowest effect of all the things he predicted, and I bet most of you guys knew that. Something that had a very high effect was the number of activities that a student was involved in. People that were involved in lots of activities tended to have better grades than people that weren't. And if you've been in a lot of activities, you know that when you have lots of activities, you've got to learn time management. And that was just about the top effect for any of the ones he looked at. Other things were things like the budget of the school, the parents' marital status, how many brothers and sisters they had the academic load, how many hours they were taking, and the size of a community. It's interesting that in Mississippi, students from larger towns did better than those from small towns in rural areas. In some places, like the upper Midwest, the opposite of that is true. Sometimes big school districts actually do not do as well as rural areas. Well, he spent a lot of time figuring out which of those were the most important, and initially he came up with a list of 12 out of those 37. Later, he actually pared it down to five, and he had his grad students come up with a formula that could be used to take those possible variables and predict a student's GPA. We then programmed that formula into a bunch of graphing calculators and gave those to the recruiters that went around to high schools. And they asked some questions of the people they talked to, looked at it quick and said, well, if you go down to Hattiesburg, you can probably expect to get a 3.2 or whatever the GPA might have been. Then the following summer, the actual work that we did 
was we went back and we looked at the results and how accurately they did predict GPA. And we found that about 80% of the time, we actually could predict it within about a quarter of a grade point, which was way better than any one of those factors did on its own. So the big idea here is that multiple regression, you use lots of inputs to predict some result. The last one is not what I really expect you to pick for the test, but it is another of the main things that can come up in statistics. It's called calculus-based statistical theory, and it's really what makes the class you're in different than a class that a math major might take. The more advanced a statistics course is, the more likely it is to include a lot of calculus. There's two main ideas that come up in calculus, and both of those can be applied to statistics. One of the topics that comes up in calculus is what are called derivatives. And derivatives, what you're looking at is how things change over time. And one thing that can change over time is statistics. And you can use that form of calculus to figure out how things change from day to day, week to week, year to year. It's actually that kind of math that they're applying to come up with those formulas that the government looks at to see what's going to happen with the coronavirus and whether we can open things up or whether we have to remain at home. The other big topic that comes up in calculus is what are called integrals or sometimes antiderivatives. And integrals, the main thing they're used for is finding areas. We actually worked with area earlier in the year. Remember all those problems where we were finding areas of different parts of the normal curve? What you did to do those is you looked up the answers in a table. Where that table came from was working out a bunch of calculus problems. And again, what a math major might do is have to do the work to come up with those. Be grateful that you don't have to do that. It's already been done for you. So again, what's going to happen with this, when you go to your quiz, you'll have a list of these topics I just talked about. You're going to pick a couple of them and just write a sentence or two that explains what they're about. You don't need to know things inside or out, but you do need to have an idea of what it's about. And that really does wrap up our whole year. It's been one of the strangest ways of ending things that I could have ever imagined, but Basically, you guys have done pretty well with this, and I'm pretty positive you're all going to end up passing and doing okay with it. So, I look forward to seeing Jack again next year. The rest of you, congratulations on graduating, and I do wish you all well in college and in the future. And, you know, I hope that this has been a productive class for you. We wish you well. Take care, everybody.